So as I already mentioned, the, uh, the title for this morning is The Power, power of Praise or Power in Praise. And uh, man, I hope that, uh, I hope that uh, what I can communicate, it just like I, I have, I've had this over the last several days, just this sense of <clears throat> um, what I opened with, right? This, this just, I mean, I just hear the whoa, whoa, whoa sound of just something radiating out of just power, just raw power that changes things in the atmosphere. And um, the context for, for today um, is absolutely in the awareness of what's going on around us and how the enemy is kind of like full court press. Had this image in my in my mind. I don't know if it's necessarily from the Holy Spirit, but I was feeling this at a meeting on Tuesday night, and uh, the picture I had in my head comes from a, um, a a book called The Art of War, Sun Tzu, Art of War. Anybody familiar with this with this with this book? So I, I've read it a few times, and it's just an interesting kind of like psychological approach to warfare. But there was one of the concepts that um, talks about when you're advancing. Right when the when the general is advancing into a, you know a, a place where you feel like there's uh, an overwhelming army if ahead of me, a, a, an opponent ahead of me, and so I'm crossing a bridge and I'm going to you know advance against this enemy, and the and the general would burn the bridges behind behind the army, right? So there's no retreat, right? He's like you're going forward, and the mindset again. This is like a that's how I think of the book. The whole book is about the psychology of warfare, the mindset, and how do you get people in the mindset to, to say there's no retreat. So you burn the bridges behind because there's no place but forward. I can't go back, right? I may, I may want to give in to timidity. I may want to give in to fear. I may want to, right, but there's no bridge there anymore. And so I have no choice but to go forward and to grab courage and to, and to step out and to, you know, like it's all or nothing. But the picture that the word I felt like from the Holy Spirit was, yeah, the enemies burned the bridges. No, the enemies burned the bridges. Not God has burned your bridges, but the enemy has burned his bridges. And that's the, that's the all in. That's what I feel like. That's the all in that the enemy has, right? I mean, if, if, if this doesn't succeed, those of you who are studying what's really kind of going on behind the scenes, it's like pedal to the metal on a particular agenda. And what that agenda is, you know, lots of conversation about that. But it's pedal to the metal, and there's no turning back. And the enemy has burned the bridges. And so for us, right, exactly, right, exactly. Pastor Kimmy said, it's showtime. It's showtime. And one of the most powerful weapons that we have available to us, uh, it kind of fits in with what we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, about how there is a place of joy available to us in his presence. There's a place of abiding. Yeah, out of that place of abiding, there comes strength and power and joy and peace that you can't find anywhere else. And it has nothing to do with what's going on around. It has nothing to do whether there's a bridge still there or not. It has nothing to do with the, you know, the enemy, whether he seems powerful and that his strategy seems clever and all that, right? It, it, makes, it, makes, it makes no difference. His presence is a game changer. Abiding in him is a game changer. But so is praise, a game changer. So Psalm, Psalm 103, lots of verses. All, all of the Psalms are just loaded with um, beautiful expressions of praise. But first few verses, Psalm 103, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me, bless his holy name. Pause. David talking to himself saying, you know, soul, I don't really care what you feel. I don't care really what's going on. I'm telling you, my soul, you're going to bless the Lord. Why? Because it doesn't have anything to do with what about me. It's not because, you know, <clears throat> our world that so revolves around self and how I feel and even whether or not I feel like I'm a male or female today, right? I mean, it's like it's like all of reality revolves around my emotions. And David says the opposite. He says to his soul, he says, I don't care what you're feeling. He is worthy. You're going to bless the Lord. There's that sense in this, in this scripture. Verse 2, bless the Lord, my soul, and do not forget any of his benefits, who pardons all your guilt, who heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with favor and compassion. That's just all so good, right? But I didn't want to put it all up on the screen. 
who redeems your life from the pit, who crowns you with loving kindness and compassion, who satisfies your years with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagle, so that your youth is renewed like the eagle. The Lord performs righteous deeds and judgments for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the sons of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He's slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness. Did you hear about our God? Our God is compassionate and he's gracious. He's slow to anger and he's abounding in loving kindness. Did you know that about the God that we serve? Did you know that's just an amazing thing to just cause praise to come up as you see him for who he really is? He will not always strive with us, nor will he keep his anger forever. He's not dealt with us according to our sins, nor rewarded us according to our iniquities. Thank you, Jesus. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. Whew, doesn't that make you just want to stop and go back into worship? It should. It should. Doesn't matter, right? Does this have does this have anything to do with the circumstances are going around with us and what our you know what our governor who gets confused sometimes about whether he's a monarch or whether he's our servant, right? Whatever political figures there are extending beyond their God given authority and and their duty to to serve, does it make any difference? Does it make any difference? Any of this? None of this has anything to do with what's going around us at all. It has to do with how good he is. Just as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he himself knows our frame. He's mindful that we are but dust. As for man, his days are like grass. As a flower of the field, so he flourishes. When the wind is passed over it, it's no more, and its place acknowledges it no more. But the loving kindness of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to his children's children. We're just going to read the whole thing. Is it good? It's good, right? I don't have to come up with anything new to preach this morning because, you know, God says it all. It's uh, if we just embrace the spirit of David, you know, he, he some of his greatest psalms were in the times of his greatest oppression. Some of the most fear where he could have been the most fearful running from Saul, hiding in caves and, you know, moving constantly because they kept finding out where he was at, and, you know, and somebody, somebody narking on him, right? And so he goes and, and, he's, and he's running for his life. And yet, and yet some of the most beautiful of his expressions come from that of I, I'm holding on to him to, for dear life. And we get, we, get, uh, we get accustomed to a Christianity that's based on kind of our comfort you know, Francis Schaeffer talks about personal peace and affluence, that these are the gods of the American people, personal peace and affluence, right? So as long as it's not really bothering me, you know, I won't really get involved. That's, that's somebody else's, somebody else's deal. But, but, you know, my own personal peace is my priority. And, and as long as I'm affluent, so I don't have affluent enough, so I don't really have any major needs, then I'm good. And those are the things that most of us will work really hard to preserve. But that's God's standard for us of what we're preserving and what we're standing for is just a little higher than personal peace and influence. Just a little bit higher, what he's called us to stand for, what he's called us to, this is the season that I've created you for. No, no uh, accident that you were created to be living during this time in history. And he called you and he, he already destined you to be a victor in whatever comes your way. The Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Bless the Lord, all you his hosts, you who serve him doing his will. Bless the Lord, all you works of his in all the places of his dominion. Bless the Lord, again he says, bless the Lord, O my soul. I think that's just a, that's just a, an amazing um, starting point for a conversation about just the importance and the power of praise, and the power of the power of worship, the power of thanksgiving.
So how do we, so how do you approach how do you approach this king who is so glorious and majestic and who's enthroned in the praises of those who fear him? How do we approach how do we approach this king? So I had just a couple of thoughts I wanted to to address on on approaching our king, and that's missing a slide. Okay, so we will improvise right here. So our visual aid this morning. So this is this is Moses' tabernacle, right? So you're familiar with this. This is they used to pack this up and pack it all throughout the desert for 40 years throughout the wilderness and reset it up every time the 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 cloud stopped in a particular location, and so they would set this up. But there's some really cool things that we can learn about praise and worship by just looking at the tabernacle. So um, s- several things. You have you have the outer court outside of the outside of the white um, fence. And then as you come into the gate, and we'll, we'll share the scripture in just a sec, but it says that we enter his gates with thanksgiving and we enter his courts with praise. So when we come through the gate, we, we come in with thanksgiving. And as we come in, that thanksgiving turns to praise. And that's just a really beautiful thought right there. We'll come back to it in a second. And it, it, it ties into what I feel like um, there's a, a scripture we'll hit in a minute about high praises, the high praises of God be in your mouth and two-edged sword in his hands, and how this, how this praise and worship, how this praise and thanksgiving kind of synergistically, I'll put it there in just a sec. Yeah, no, I'll put it there in just a sec. <clears throat> so, but also there's other, there's other pretty cool things here, right? This is the, the brazen altar. So this is a place of sacrifice, Right, when the priest would come in, and, and it, it's dealing with the fact that, that there's sin that needs to be atoned for, and there's a, there's a cost to pay as we come into his presence. Then the next one is the, uh, the, the laver, where there's, again, it's a cleansing. It's a, it's a, it's a washing. The priest would ceremonially wash, and they would wash the sacrifices, and it was a significant um, part of, uh, I'm approaching the king. It, there's gravity in that I am approaching the king of kings. And as they moved forward through the tabernacle, each, each event and each sacrament that they experienced <clears throat> was part of this, how do you approach a king? How do you approach the king of kings? The scripture says, you know, those who come with clean hands and a pure heart. So there's, a, there's, a, there's something that needs to get cut away and burned up and washed away. And, and the person of Jesus fulfills all of these Old Testament it's a, it's a whole other, this is, this is a series of messages to, to talk about how much meaning there is in the tabernacle. But uh, then after the priest goes to the labor, then he, he actually changes clothes into his priestly garments before he goes into the holy place. Holy place has s- certain uh, furnishings in it that are all, again, pictures of the person of Jesus Christ. Right, where we have communion, right? The table of showbread and the, the golden altar of incense and the and the lampstand, and uh, there's there's just there's just so much to talk about of any of those. But the progression is this way into the holy of holies, where the ark of the covenant was and where the very presence of God is, and where if you went without clean hands and a pure heart, then and the bells around your tunic stopped ringing, they had a rope tied to the foot of the high priest, and they drag him on out. Because it was a big deal to come in and approach the king, and to approach the king the way that he should be approached, with reverence and awe and fear. <clears throat> and um, so all of this is, 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 so, is so beautiful, and that's kind of Old Testament. <clears throat> um, love that picture. Old Testament um, scripture. Okay, go ahead and put the PowerPoint back up. Okay, so here's, here's the verse for it. Psalm 95, 1 and 2. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let's come before his presence with a song of thanksgiving. Let's shout joyfully to him in songs with instruments. So we're coming into his presence. And we're coming in first and foremost with thankfulness and gratefulness welling up in our... All right, we'll just put it over here. 
I did have a slide. I, I, I wasn't that unprepared. That's funny. That's not terribly impressive, is it? <laughs> okay. So we come in his presence with thongs of thanksgiving. And it's not just an Old Testament concept because here's what it says in Hebrews 13. Through him then let us let continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God that is the fruit of lips praising his name. So how do you love a king? You, you, you love a king and you come in the way and you present yourself to him in the way that we can honor a king, where fear of the Lord comes in and it modifies. And we, 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 we go through that brazen altar process and we say, God, would you burn up anything in me that, that doesn't honor and please you? God, would you wash with your word? Would you wash with your blood? Would you wash me and cleanse me of anything that isn't pleasing to you? And so it's saying the same thing, right? Just we got New Testament fulfilling these Old, these old Testament picture and images but it's Christ that fulfills all of them. And next week we're talking about, you know, one of the feasts and how Christ is fulfill it. Christ also fulfills and is fulfilling the feasts also through time. It's all fulfilled in the person of Christ. But how do we approach a king? Clean hands and a pure heart. Clean hands and a pure heart. And, and that, that process of letting him wash over us allows us to, when we come into his presence, it, it, it allows for something amazing to happen through this idea of praise and thanksgiving and what happens with his presence in the context of praise and thanksgiving. Psalm 22, 3, Yet you are holy, you who are enthroned upon the praises of Israel. What happens his presence come down, comes down when, he, when the praise and the worship goes up. It's enthroned on your praises. When, when we, this idea, this wah, wah sound, the power coming out when you praise, it's because his presence is enthroned on your praises. It is, it is, uh, it is so powerful, so overwhelming to any other sound, to any other power that might try to lift its name up and say, look at me, I'm really strong and powerful. God's not, God's, not, <clears throat> God's not intimidated, it's not even close. Into Psalm 149. <clears throat> praise the Lord, sing a new song to the Lord and his praise in the congregation of the godly ones. Israel shall be joyful in his maker, the sons of Zion shall rejoice in their king. They shall praise his name with dancing. They shall sing praises to him with tambourine and lyre. For the Lord takes pleasure in his people and will glorify the lowly with salvation. Verse 5, the godly ones shall be jubilant in glory. They shall sing for joy on their beds. The high praises of God shall be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hands. To execute vengeance on the nations and punishment on the people. To bind their kings with chains, their dignitaries with shackles of iron. To execute against them the judgment written. This is the honor for all his godly ones. Praise the Lord. Just, just to think of what is it that's on our hearts and what is it on our minds? What thoughts are going through your mind when you go to sleep at night? What thoughts on your mind when you get up in the morning? An encouragement is there is power in your praise. And when you just let gratefulness and thankfulness well up in your spirit and what comes off in your mouth right when your feet hit the floor, and I don't know if, how true it is just generally, but I think that the Holy Spirit puts a song in our heart. I wake up with a different song almost every morning on my heart, you know, walking down the star stairs and there's, and there's, there's already a song in, in my heart because that's just, that's just what comes out when we see him for who he really is. It's just the natural, that's just the natural byproduct of, of praise and thanksgiving or the natural byproducts of seeing him for who he really is. <clears throat> so I think... Yeah, so I just wanted to cover just a couple. There's like, a, I think, six major Hebrew words that, that kind of go into the ideas of praise. And we're not going to cover them all today, but I just thought that a couple of them would just stir, stir things up a little bit. Because I don't know what your, your, your teaching or background is in praise. If you've been around here in a, a while, this is all kind of old conversation. But, but one, of the, one of the first words, and the word hallelujah comes from, but get the definition of the word halal. To make a show or boast, to be clamorously foolish, to go about in a raging or raving way, to dance, 
to celebrate. So what picture comes to your mind when you, when you, when you think about to go about in a raging or raving way? Does any picture come to your mind? Picture that comes to my mind exactly is David, right? And we have the scripture. I probably won't get to it today, but we have, I have the scripture in the notes also. But it's, it just says, you know, to his wife, Michael, who's, who's um, as the, as the uh, Ark of the Covenant is coming back into Israel, it says that David stripped down to just his linen ephod, right? His undergarments, essentially, and is dancing wildly before the Lord in front of the, in front of the Ark of the Covenant. And Michael looks up and says, wow, just how glorious the king was before all the maidens today, showing himself in his undergarments. And David's response is just, is just, you know, awesome. He just says, you know what, I'll I'll, I'll be more undignified even than this, right? Because the God who rejected your father is the God who's made me king. And he's coming back in his presence, is coming back into Jerusalem. He says, I'll be even more undignified than this. Do you picture that? To make a show or boast? to be clamorously foolish, to go about in raging or raving way, to dance and to celebrate. So when we sing the song, I raise a hallelujah, I raise a hallelujah, we're still kind of dignified, aren't we? Kind of sit there. I bet you guys don't even get out of your pew. Huh? You guys stay safely in your pew. And uh, is, that, is, that, is that a picture of uh, clamorously foolish? How many are just really eager to be clamorously foolish? Come on. That's awesome. That's awesome. Half of you. The other half of you are, are uh, maybe, maybe more honest. I don't know, right? But <laughs> there, is, there is something to be about being more undignified than this in the presence of our king. He just is really that good. He just is really that awesome. And, you know, celebrating and doing the wave and painting your face and chest at a football game compared to coming into the presence of the God who is just really that good. He's just really that good. Separates, we just read it, right? Separates your, your, your iniquities as far as the east is from the west. Now, that's something to get pretty excited about, not, yeah, go Rams, right? <laughs> He's just that good. So that's halal, the word from which hallelujah comes, right, to, to make a sure boast. So when you think about raising a hallelujah and worshiping Jesus, for all of how good he is and coming before him with clean hands and a pure heart and just really seeing this God that we worship. Just, just think about that, right? That so much of how we worship is just based on our culture. Maybe it's the church that you're raised up in. Maybe it's what you've, you've seen, uh, uh, observed around. But it's, it's, it's maybe not the picture. How do we come and how do we worship a king? How do we honor a king? Well, we, we honor him with the praise that he's worthy of. Not what I feel like, not what I'm comfortable with, not what we did, you know, in the church that I grew up in. I'm not, not, not knocking it. Lots of good things about that. But I'm like, are we bringing God, are we bringing God what he asks for? Are we bringing what he says that his presence, right, his, that he's just enthroned in your praises? But this is praise. This is what the word, one of the words, one of the Hebrew words that praise is translated as. And then yada means to throw, thrust, or cast away from, hands outward, to throw hands into the air. I don't know how many of you had, had, had the experience of first time you ever raised hands in church. I'm sorry, you're writing. <laughs> first time you ever raised hands in church, had a conversation with a, you know, just in the last year, right, where, where I, he told me about, just right about where Matt's sitting, maybe the pew back, he's just like, you know, I've been for weeks feeling like I just need to put my hands up in the air, but I just haven't been able to do it, you know, and it wasn't, no, I don't think it was weeks, I think it was months, and he just comes, and he's like, you know, and finally, he, he, he tells me about it when he puts his hands up in the air, and he throws his hands up in the air, and what a victory that was for him, and, and yet, this is what the word, this is one of the words, what it means to praise, to throw or thrust or cast away from hands outward, to throw hands into the air. Do you, do you see just kind of a recklessness and, a, and an abandonment to that whole, the, to the very definition of the word? And so this is two of, of six words. Some of the others are pretty crazy too, right? One of them is, uh, is to twirl about violently. Oh, yeah. Well, practice today. We're to twirl around, <laughs> twirl around violently. So see this big aisle in the middle? That's what it's for, right? It's so you can get out of your pew and twirl around before God. It's all good, right? It's... It's all good. In fact, it's more than good. It's awesome. You know, don't whack anybody with your, you know, but, 
but it's it's a beautiful thing and it brings glory to God. And when we and when we let uh, the fear of excess, right? Because there can be excess, right? There's times when people worship and it's just the flesh and it's just drawing attention to them. And so sometimes we're so concerned about not being in that excess that we just don't we just don't give God what He's due. And you know that's it's not the whole point of the message today, but it's relevant to just consider that you know the natural byproduct of seeing him for who he is is exactly these kind of words halal and yada right to throw up our hands and just say man you're just god you're so good how can i how can i stay restrained sitting on my hands in my pew because i'm worried about what everybody else might think when what he thinks is all that matters one of our good friends did a worship album it's still one of my favorite worship albums uh, um, uh, it's called an audience of one <laughs> Right. And and, uh, you know, bless our friend Rupert. Um, but that's really the heart of it. Right. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm only here and there's only one person's approval that matters one. And, and it's his. And I want to give him the praise that he's due. So, again, it's the natural result of seeing him for who he is. <clears throat> so th- a play on words, an honest appraiser becomes a praiser. So you think of an appraiser, right? Somebody who goes around, okay, I'm just checking out your house and I'm seeing what the value is of the house and I'm appraising maybe the, you know, your, your antique or your car. I'm appraising, I'm, I'm, I'm discerning its value and I'm reporting on its value. So just consider that an honest appraiser just naturally becomes a praiser because when you really appraise just how beautiful and amazing our God is, when you really appraise how intricately everything that he's put together is. When you think about all of the thoughts and all of his, of his presence that holds it all together, when you just consider that all creation, all creation testifies to his goodness. All of creation testifies to his existence. And su- facts such that in the Proverbs it says that a fool has said in his heart there is no God. It's like, you know, there can be lots of, Lots of room in there for discovering who God is. Okay, so, you know, lots of, lots of world religions, you know, worship a God, you know, a, a divine, you know, highest form, highest being, and different, different facets, and that could be part of our discovery. But it's absolutely foolishness to say there isn't one. That's what the proverb says. It's just absolutely foolishness because all of creation testifies to his goodness. But an honest appraiser... An honest appraiser who takes it all in, it leads them right to the foot of the cross. It will. I think every searcher for truth, genuine searcher for truth, genuine appraiser will worship at the foot of the cross and will find their way because God, God is looking for those who, who will worship him in spirit and in truth, who will come with clean hands and a pure heart. And when we search honestly with a pure heart, we find him. He'll be found of us. <coughs> Thanksgiving and praise, a divine whirlwind. So we just read the scripture, right? Psalm 149, high praises of God in your mouth and a two-edged sword in his hand. So I was just thinking like, what? You know, I've never really heard anybody talk to me. I mean, I use the term high praises, but what are high praises? Like low praises and high praises, medium praises? I mean, how do you, how do you get to high praises? And so this is the thought that I felt like Holy Spirit, and I'll just submit it to you, and, you know, you can you know, do a little digging on it on your own. But as I was, as I was thinking about the high, high praises, that's the thought, is it's like a divine whirlwind. It, it's like the, the uh, uh, what's the word? Um, what do you call a machine, the self-perpetual motion machine? Perpetual motion machine that just somehow just keeps going forever and doesn't require any new energy inputs, right? It's a perpetual motion machine. I kind of feel like that about, gratefulness and thankfulness and praise that all those things are just they're just like a whirlwind they're like a perpetual motion machine because the more that I praise him and the more that I look at him and I and I and I see him for who he is the more grateful I am and the more thankfulness that comes out and the more thankful I am the more I want to praise and so it just creates this whirlwind right and I think that's that's what I think high praise is maybe that's what the high praises are is it's just this Entering into the whirlwind of just saying, I'm overwhelmed by how good you are. And entering into that presence, and it's, it's like we get to stay there all the time. That's part of abiding in his presence. 
is it that we abide in awareness of who he is. We abide in this constant revelation of just how good he is. We abide in the fact that he's with us always, and that he never leaves us or forsake us, forsakes us. We just abide in those thoughts. And so they just create this, this perpetual whirlwind of praise that leads to thanksgiving, which leads to gratefulness, which leads to more praise, which leads to more thanksgiving, which leads to more gratefulness, which leads to more praise. How about the high praises? Let's just get on that whirlwind of praise and goodness to God. So then the thought about frequency. I have a, an illustration here. Um, well, next slide, I'll tell you. But more powerful than any frequency the enemy can devise, clothe yourself in praise. Garments of praise, clothe and protect. They release healings in spirit, soul, and body. So the thought, if that isn't clear enough, is that just being in the presence of praise is healing. Being in the presence of praise, being in the presence of God, he's enthroned in the praises of his people. Just being in his presence alone is lots of conversation about frequencies, you know, and in and, and all sorts of different facets, right? You know, just, hey, man, I just really like your vibe. And people are, were aware of, you know, what other people transmit and communicate. And right now, there's, there's a fair amount of frequency coming in that's about kind of oppression or withholding of, tr of truth, of manipulation, of, of coercion. Lots of this kind of pressure coming in, and it's a, there's a frequency to it. There's a frequency to love, and there's a frequency to hate, and, there's, and I'll show you a picture here in just a minute. But... But there is nothing more powerful than the frequency that comes by being in the presence of God. So check this image out. So this is from, uh, maybe some of you heard of David Hawkins, and I, years ago I did a message on this, and I, that, that's okay, that's readable, yeah? So this is from David Hawkins, and it's a book called um, Power Versus Force. And I, I found it a really enjoyable read. I read it a, a couple of times, it was so good. But uh, this guy, David Hawkins, was a physician, and he, he just pretty much left his practice and went on his pursuit of, of, of spiritual, right, of getting closer to God. And, and so he wrote a book, right, coming from a kind of from the medical background and from a psychological background and then bringing it into his journey in faith. And this is one of the byproducts of, of this book. So um, what he did is he, he, you see the log, right? So he, he's measuring the force, if you will. He's measuring the frequency of all these different components. So it starts at the bottom with shame being the lowest energy frequency of all of them. And it goes on up and it ends with what he calls enlightenment. But you see the top four, enlightenment, peace, joy, love, right? 500, right? So um, I don't exactly, you know, maybe one of our audiophiles can teach me someday about how it is that you, you measure, like, you know, the frequency there's a there's a website maybe fun to check out <clears throat> a friend of mine did a a whole uh, website of music remastered in 528 megahertz right and it's called five dot com i think right and so it just all, about music of all genres but he remastered it in five yeah melissa could probably give us some insight into this but but it's it's the frequency of love 528 megahertz and it and it changes things as it as as this frequency emanates out but what I wanted to show you is just <clears throat> pride, anger, desire, fear, grief, apathy, guilt, and shame. All of these. And the power that they transmit in this idea of frequency is all on the lower half. And courage, you'll notice, 200, right? Courage is the pivot point. Courage is the pivot point because courage is the place where you either you face uh, something that's a challenge and you either back away from it and you go into fear, which drops you down in frequency. All of these things, anxiety, fear, grief, apathy, all these things are what we're seeing around us, right? Or at the point of courage, you step up and you say, uh, you know what, I think I can step up. I think that the God is in me is greater than he who is in the world. I think that there is something so much more powerful. I think there's something to just be praise and grateful about I think that and you just start to go up the scale and you know Hawkins's determination is, is that you might in your lifetime 
and I don't believe this. I just wanted to tell you what he said. He says that you might go up 30 or 40 points in a lifetime. So if you started at courage and you're saying, okay, well, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm willing to kind of turn away from all of this old habits that bring me down into despair and, and hopelessness, and I'm willing to turn my face towards this that might say that there's another reality I can live in. He says you might actually go from 200 to 230 in a lifetime. I don't think that that's what God says at all. I think that God can take you exponentially from the pit all the way up to the mountaintop. He can in his presence if we will respond to him and abide in him and respond to his beckoning and his invitation to come in and to be in his presence. Because the more we're in his presence, the more he changes, the more we're in his word, the more we hear what he says about us, the more it changes our thoughts and we're renewed, we're transformed by renewing of our minds, right? And letting him and just being in his presence just says, tell me what you think, dad. I want to know what you think about what's going on around me right now because I feel the temptation to go down into fear or despair. But I know, God, this moment of shift is courage. And that's where I just look towards my father instead of look to my circumstances. Amen? You look to your father instead of to your circumstances. And as we see him for who he is, we just start to get onto that whirlwind. And that whirlwind takes us right up into the most powerful frequencies on this chart. Love, joy, peace. Enlightenment, you know, it's kind of a, it's kind of a fussy word, you know, full of all sorts of, of different people's ideas. But if you think of, if you just think of, maybe if he just used the word of just abiding in his presence, right, where we're hanging out and, and maybe, that's, maybe that's a better picture than, than the word enlightenment for us in our, in our vocabulary. But love, joy, and peace, and it's, it becomes this whirlwind, this, this ever-ascending place of one affirming the other. Is that a cool chart? Power versus force. You might enjoy the book. Then Luke 19, they shouted over and over, highest praises to God for the one who comes as king in the name of the Lord. Heaven's peace and glory from the highest realm now comes to us. So I should read that in the Passion. It's so good in the Passion. <clears throat> but the context, right? So Jesus is coming into Jerusalem and people are going nuts, right? They're throwing their coats in the, they're throwing palm leaves on and this is halal and yada, right? They're clamorously, foolishly making a big deal about the king is coming into Jerusalem. They're not, they're not sitting real quietly on their hands. They are engaged in this in a very physical and clamorous way, right? You hear lots of you know, uh, lots of scriptures about the, the timbrel, right? Tambourine, clanging cymbals, right? Loud, loud stuff that just doesn't go with the organ. Just doesn't fit with the organ somehow, right? And yet, and yet it's, it's, it's clamorous and it's loud. And it's making a big deal about God coming into Jerusalem, Jesus coming into Jerusalem. So that's the context, right? And they're saying, highest praises to God for the one who comes as king in the name of the Lord. Heaven's peace and glory from the highest realm now comes to us. That's something to be excited about, right? They've been waiting thousands of years for the coming of Jesus, and here he comes. And that's something worth getting excited about. Way more than the Raiders. <laughs> Verse 39, some Jewish religious leaders who stood off from the procession said to Jesus, teacher, order your followers at once to stop saying these things. And Jesus responds, listen to me, if my followers were to silence, the very stones would break forth with praises. Why? Because it's the most natural thing in the world to let praise come forth with us when we see the king for who he really is. And it's also quite natural to stand back in the flesh and say, I don't know, kind of looks like a little radical. Looks like they're, they're kind of, I don't know what, Jesus freaks? or whatever, right? Something, something that says that anything other than sitting and being a spectator is inappropriate. But God doesn't call you to be spectators. God invites you. This is the whole message of Jesus is, is that he comes and he says, okay, so we've had these religious middlemen for millennia. And I came to introduce you directly to my father and to cut out the middleman. You just go right through me, the door, and you go right into his presence, right into the Holy of Holies. Jesus died. Remember that the, the, 
the temple curtain was ripped from top to bottom, right? Ripped that massive curtain from top to bottom, just saying, now there's no more barriers to you coming right in and hanging out in the very presence of my, of my father. Cut out the middle man. He says, it's for you. It's not for us to be spectators. It's for us to get filled up, walk in who he's called us to be, believe that you are who he says you are. Let everything else, that moment of courage, let everything else dissipate away in those lower frequencies and let God challenge and inspire you at that moment of decision when fear comes in and tempts you to pay attention to, a, to it. That, that moment just changes my focus from what's going on around me to him and the goodness of God. So we say, as Pastor Kimberly mentioned earlier, right, we're, you know, we're not planning to go anywhere, right? We're here to worship God and to keep our eyes on him and to focus on him. And that's our mandate. It's not, in, it's not in defiance of anything anybody else is trying to do. It's just saying that we're serving the highest authority that there is. And I want you to pay attention if, if, you, if you would notice the, to, just as a, I should have put it up there. But, you know, there's a whole new series of, of quote unquote mandates that have come down over the last couple of days. And uh, they're encouraging businesses to ask you, you know, what's your vaccination status and have you had tested in the last 72 hours? And if so, per, you know, kind of encourage them to, to not serve you if, if you don't respond how they want you to respond to those questions and all that, right? But if you'll notice the opening line of, of Governor Ige's proclamation, it says, we urge businesses to da 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 And then he goes into all this about mandates below that, starting with we urge I am encouraging you business owners to do this because, you know, I recognize it's, you know, it's carefully worded. I recognize that I, I, I'm exceeding my authority. I recognize I can't tell you anything what to do, but I urge you, I urge you to consider these things. And then it goes on to sound like a lot, a lot like a mandate. Problem is, is that when people don't listen, then they hear it and they're, they're going to do that. They're going to say, well, you know, he mandated this, so I guess I got to do it. And if, 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 that's, if that's our source of authority, rather than our authority is in, is in God, our authority is in the Holy Spirit, the authority is in what he, what he speaks to me, the natural law that governs my life that says do no harm, for starters, and then moves us into love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. It doesn't just stay from the doing harm. It moves us as Christians into right initiate into the world around you and do as much good as you can because you have an infinite source of goodness to draw from and where do we get that we get that by being in his presence getting on the whirlwind of his goodness and the whirlwind of high praises if you don't the rocks cry out john livingston this is an interesting quote john livingston is i think a scottish uh, preacher in the like 1600s he said this he says I will praise thee, alas, typo, sorry. I will praise thee, alas, for the capital crime of the Lord's people, barrenness of praise. Oh, how fully I'm persuaded that a line of praise is worth a leaf, a whole page of prayer. An hour of praise is worth a day of fasting and mourning. Interesting. I, I thought it was just a really thought-provoking, thought-provoking quote that praise is just that powerful. Praise gets us into the place and the position that when you do make your petitions, what's the, Lord prayer, what's the Lord's prayer said? Our Father, which art in heaven, how does the first line of the Lord's prayer start? Right? Hallowed be your name. It starts with, I'm, I'm getting my eyes on you, and I just, just reminding myself and my flesh and my mind and my emotions just how good you are. It starts, with, it starts with praise. And it just, uh, it goes into petition. Lord, give us this day our daily bread. Petition's okay. But when we enter with praise and we start with praise, we can save a whole heck of a lot of petition because it's not like we need to talk God into doing what he's promised. When you, when you look at God and say, well, what has God promised? And then you attach your faith onto what he's already promised, right? There's, there's no persuasion there it's it's then you become a prophetic declarer you become 
let there be light to the world around you. You get to be let there be light. You get to declare his promises because he's good for his promises. And that puts us in a place of power and faith. Amen? John Livingston. So praise him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Halal, yada, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. When that John Livingston quote and you say, well, this is the, this is the capital crime of the church is that we're anemic in our praise. We're anemic in our worship. I don't know how that hits you, but sometimes I'm, sometimes I'm more reserved than I should be in the presence of a God who's just worth going crazy about. So as that applies to you, be challenged. Let the Holy Spirit challenge you. But there is some power that comes of being in his presence. And this, this, you guys all laugh at me when I make the woo woo sound, right? But it's just this, the power, the power emanates from that place of praise. Because it, it gets us, it gets us on his frequency. It gets us connecting with him. It gets us we become like him as we see him for who he really is, right? We become, and so it doesn't matter what's going on around us. Be encouraged and challenged to make praise a deliberate part of your day. Say to your soul, to your soul, hey soul, put your trust in God. Hey soul, praise God. Hey soul, I'm going to make sure that his praises are what's on my lips throughout the day. And this create this. This creates the atmosphere of power that he called you to live in. So enough talk about that. <clears throat> Dakota, would you come on up? I thought, it'd be, uh, thought I'd like to end on a couple of worship songs, right? There's a couple of praise songs, and Dakota's going to lead us in a, in a couple of songs. If you can just keep that thought in your mind of the, the pulsing power that comes as we see him for who he really is. If you just let that, and we'll, cl we'll close the service with just pulsing power that changes the atmosphere around us, that changes all those lower frequencies and just overwhelms them with goodness and grace, with joy, with peace, with love. Are you coming? So, One to three um, this afternoon at Suisan intersection. A bunch of people are going to be out there waving signs.